If you've ever wondered why the cheaper version of two camera siblings is better for video than its higher resolution counterpart, like the Nikon Z6 is compared to the Z7, or the Sony a7 III versus the Sony a7R III, well today's video is going to explain that. Let's get undone. What is happening everybody? I'm Gerald Undone and today we're talking about sensor readout in video. More specifically, how your camera takes the image that it sees and turns it into 4K or 1080p. These methods are where you might have heard the terms pixel binning or line skipping and that's exactly what we're going to compare. From a practical standpoint, this information is useful when deciding upon a camera for video because it can often save you quite a bit of money. Take the new Nikons for example. The recently released Nikon Z6, which only costs 60% of its higher resolution counterpart, the Z7, is the superior camera for video and this primarily has to do with the way that the camera pushes down its image into 4K. While I'm pointing at this camera, I should mention that this Nikon Z6 was provided to me by Camera Canada. Camera Canada has a fantastic selection of Nikon bodies and lenses, and it's the best choice for Canadians looking to get their hands on the new Nikons, so make sure you check them out using the links in the description below. Okay, so for this video there are four techniques I want to discuss, which are the ones that you're most likely to encounter, and they are oversampling, pixel binning, line skipping, and cropping. So before we compare the processes, let's explain why we even need one in the first place. So when you shoot video with a hybrid photo camera, the sensor isn't exactly configured to match the resolution or aspect ratio of the final video. Let's take the Nikon Z6 here again, which has a resolution of 6000 by 4000 pixels, which is a 3 to 2 aspect ratio. But an Ultra HD video has a 16 to 9 aspect ratio and is usually 3840 by 2160 pixels. So the camera has to use a method of taking that photo sized image and making it video sized. And the method that it's designed to use is usually based on the capabilities of the processor in the camera. With that, generally the easier this method is for the camera to perform, the worse the end result quality will be. So let's start off with the easiest operation and thus the ugliest result cropping. With cropping, the camera basically just grabs the 4K image that it needs out of the middle of the frame and ignores the rest of the frame completely. This has two major drawbacks. First, it changes your field of view, which is annoying when you switch between photo and video modes, but it also restricts you to the minimum amount of data possible when creating that 4K image. This is the area where the latest Canon camera has taken a huge amount of flack. The end result, when compared to other cameras, is an image that's softer, less detailed, and provides a suboptimal field of view. If we compare this to what the Nikon Z6 does, which is oversampling, and the best of the four methods that we're going to discuss today, we can really see the benefit of having that extra processing power. First of all, a little note on oversampling. There's much debate over the correct usage of the terms oversampling and downsampling, and I think much of this confusion comes from the fact that these terms originate in frequencies, in which samples serves a much more logical position amongst the current theorems. But when it comes to video, we're using them less to describe the sampling frequency and more to describe the resolution capabilities of the sensor. This is especially true when it comes to post-production and you're trying to describe the process of taking 4K video and pushing it down into a 1080p timeline. I suppose a more apt term would be over-resing or down-resing, but regardless, the most simplistic way of looking at it would be oversampling is starting with a higher quality than needed, typically twice as high as the rate required, and then downsampling is the decimation process where that signal is conformed back to the required rate. Like I said, the use of these terms when it comes to video is debatable, but essentially what it means is using a camera that's capable of 8K, but then taking that 8K image to create a brilliant 4K image with less noise, aliasing, moiré, and color anomalies. So let's talk a little bit about how it achieves those things so that we can better recognize the shortcomings of the other methods. First, let's talk about noise. Noise is generally improved in two ways when it comes to downsampling techniques, and those ways are averaging and shrinking. So let's look at noise shrinking first, and then we'll get into averaging when we talk about pixel binning. Because noise is generated relative to pixel size, an oversampled image will source from smaller pixels and thus smaller noise. So if you needed 3,840 pixels to to fit across the horizontal on this frame, but you sourced it from a camera like the Nikon Z6 that uses 6,000 pixels in an oversampled image, you would effectively be utilizing smaller pixels than required to fill this frame. These smaller pixels mean that the noise is smaller as well, since the noise gets its size and shape from the pixels it's created in. This gives the appearance that an image is less noisy, even if the quality of the noise hasn't changed. The reverse is also true, which is why your photographs seem noisier when you heavily crop them and thus is one of the main reasons why cropped 4K video is worse than oversampled video. The same exact thing is true for aliasing. In simple terms, aliasing is the jaggy edges you see when an object doesn't have enough information to produce a smooth look. 
Pixel size directly affects aliasing in a logical way. If you have more, smaller pixels, you can make finer shapes seem smoother, but if you have fewer, larger pixels, those same shapes will seem rough and jagged. To put it in a fun way, try and form a circle with four large squares, and then try and form a circle with 400 small squares. The second is much, much easier. So just like with noise, when you're sampling from an image with a higher resolution and you press it down into 4K, you get less aliasing because you're using more, smaller pixels. This is also what leads to more Moiré in your images. Moiré is that fringing artifact that makes patterns seem like they're moving. Generally you'll find that as aliasing increases, so does the instance rate of Moiré. Now the common solution to solve these problems is an AA filter, or anti-aliasing filter, sometimes called an optical low-pass filter in certain cameras, but you can think of these things more as a blur filter. These filters are becoming less common as the pixel counts increase in cameras, because that makes the pixel smaller, and as we just discussed, more smaller pixels means that you can create complex shapes more smoothly and with less jaggies, but if you've ever tried to fix aliasing or moiré in your images, you know that adding a little bit of a blur effect can help remove it, and that's essentially what these filters do. And the inclusion of this filter is one of the differences between the Nikon Z6 and the Nikon Z7. And the same is also true for Sony. In fact, a lot of what we say about the Nikons can be mirrored onto the Sonys, the a7 III being the Nikon Z6 and the a7 R3 being the Nikon Z7. In this case, though, it's the lower resolution, less expensive camera that has the AA filter and the higher megapixel pixel camera, the Z7 or the a7R 3 does not have one. Now what's interesting is that when it comes to video, this is probably the opposite of what would produce the best results, but we'll get into that when we talk about the Super 35 modes. But essentially, what I'm trying to say is that these AA filters are based with photography in mind and are tuned for that purpose. And what I mean by tuned is that you can calibrate the filter to provide less blur or more blur, and sometimes this can have a heavy impact on the image, and other times it can be quite subtle. But in all cases, having an AA filter will produce an image that's slightly less sharp than if you didn't have one. If you put all this information so far together, you can really see why cropping is inferior. We don't get to use the smaller pixels, which means we're not going to see any improvements when it comes to noise or aliasing, which means a higher incidence of fringing and moiré, and to eliminate that, we need a stronger AA filter, which means more blur, which means a softer image, and it'll be a less detailed image because we don't get the greater detail of the oversampled resolution and it changes your field of view. So what about line skipping? Well, line skipping is what the Nikon Z7 and the Sony a7R 3 do when they're in full frame mode. And it's pretty much what it sounds like. Rather than crop the 4K out of the center, the camera skips lines of pixels to reduce the readout to the needed resolution, in this case 4K. Now there's different algorithms and methods to do this, but if we go back to our example of having 6,000 pixels across the horizontal and you need 3840 for Ultra HD, you just skip the 2160 that you don't need. It's a bit more complicated than that, and like I said, there's algorithms that blend and recompile the image during the skipping process, but that's the most basic explanation of how it works. Now if we apply our criticisms of cropping to this process, we can see some benefits, but most of the cons still remain. The benefits are that it's fast. Maybe not as fast as cropping, but still way faster and easier than oversampling. This way the camera doesn't melt in your hand when you're trying to process the full sensor readout of the 46 megapixel sensor on the Nikon Z7. That's higher than 8K, by the way. But where it beats cropping is that it doesn't change your field of view, because no centralized cropping is taking place. But it still suffers from the other problems, because if we skip the pixels, then we're not going to have them to improve aliasing. And we won't have them for the averaging of noise, or the reduction of fringing and artifacts. So the image is still harsher and less detailed than an oversampled one, but this is where some strange trade-offs start to occur. Because like we said earlier, the larger cameras don't have the AA filter, they don't have anything to help blur away the fringing and the jaggies. So it may be sharper, but it's not necessarily a good kind of sharper. Now the Z7 and A7R3 do have another way of dealing with this, which is sort of a combination technique, which occurs when you enable the DX or Super 35 modes on those cameras. The first step is a crop, which grabs only the center 1.5 times factor portion of the frame. So the 8,256 horizontal pixels of the Nikon Z7 become 5,504 when you enable the 1.5 times crop mode. This will change your field of view because it's a proper crop. Then the camera downsamples the rest of that image into 4K. The lower pixel count due to the 1.5 times crop is easier for the processor to handle and thus it doesn't require binning or line skipping when in this mode. This gives you more effective pixels on the Z7 than if you use the full frame line skipping method and still gives you some of the benefits of the oversampling like found on the Z6. Now it's not quite as strong as a benefit as the Z6 because the Z6 has 6,000 pixels when doing the full sensor readout, where the Z7 only has 5,504 when you're in DX mode. But it does produce a nicer image than the line skipped method, and is 90% of the quality of the Z6 with only one major con, that again your field of view is going to change by that 1.5 times crop. 
And this is where I said that it's kind of the opposite for video when it comes to which camera gets the AA filter. For photos, it makes sense, sure. The Z7 has vastly more pixels than the Z6 does. But when we're comparing these oversampled video modes, because of the 1.5 times crop, the Z7 actually has fewer pixels than the Z6 and would be more in need of the AA filter than the Z6 would be. Now let's talk about the most complicated one of the bunch, pixel binning. Pixel binning has many more approaches to it than the previous methods and the one that benefits the most from innovation. The algorithms and measurements used in pixel binning leave space for improvement through design that have created better results year over year. With Sony currently discussing a complex weighted pixel binning approach in their latest 8K sensor announcement. But here's my simplified explanation of pixel binning. Remember the color science video where we talked about the Bayer filter your sensor uses to collect color information in a particular array? Well, if we had more pixels than we needed and we wanted to push that down into 4K, one way to do it would be to combine like pixels. So maybe in a block of 16 pixels, we combine all four reds into one larger red, all four blues into one larger blue, and the eight greens into two larger greens. That way you keep the same pattern in your array, but you shrink your resolution by four times. And this is also where that noise averaging thing we talked about earlier comes in. By combining the pixels, the noise that comes along with them will also be combined and hopefully averaged to produce a better signal to noise ratio. The goal is to evaluate each of those pixels while choosing the best bits that they have to offer when it comes to detail, but also the areas that have the least amount of noise. The techniques for doing this can get much more complicated, and often these days involves assigning specific weight values to a large array of pixels, and then combining them in intelligent ways to maximize their potency. In short, your resolution goes down, but your signal to noise ratio goes up, giving you a smaller, cleaner image. The key takeaway here though is that pixel binning is not line skipping, even though you may comment see them bundled together in camera reviews. While ideally you want to use oversampling, when that's not available, pixel binning is definitely preferable to line skipping. It does, however, still suffer the same issue that any larger pixel configuration will, increased aliasing, fringing, and moiré. For the same reasons we mentioned before, when you have bigger blocks to work with, your shapes are jaggier and more susceptible to anomalies. But in the case of pixel binning, the blocks are cleaner, and that's definitely an improvement. Pixel binning doesn't change your field of view either, which is a plus, but it does require more processing power than line skipping or cropping, but not quite as much as oversampling. And that's where the limitations come from. The higher quality readout methods take longer to do than the lower quality ones, which means you need a faster processor to be able to do them fast enough to generate an acceptable frame rate. And the higher the frame rate, the faster still the processor needs to be. Faster processors require more power and generate more heat. So it's really all a balancing act between output, power consumption, and heat control. And in the case of the latest Nikons and the Sonys that came before them, the Z6, while cheaper, balances those aspects better than its bigger brother. So your cameras aren't going to melt in your hand while processing the 46 megapixel... Meg <laughs> megapixel. But that's going to be it for me. I hope you found this video helpful or at least entertaining. And if you did, make sure you leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, feel free to hit the dislike button twice. All right. I'm done.